Waters program. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, my name is Dustin Wisterman. I'm the Associate Director for TU's Mid-Atlantic Cold Water Habitat Restoration Program, um, where we focus on watershed scale restoration in Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. Um, our work focuses on, focuses on reconnecting high quality brook trout uh, strongholds uh, in an attempt to create these fluvial populations of fish that move from the small tributaries into the larger rivers and in an effort to restore the robust fisheries that we once saw within this region. Um, I'll kick it over to Mark to give an introduction. Thanks, Dustin um, and Jeff. I'm Mark Taylor. I'm the Eastern Communications Director, um, a title quite a bit shorter than Dustin's, uh, based here in Roanoke, Virginia, so um, close to the West Virginia line, but I'm right in the heart of the Blue Ridge here in Appalachian tr Trout Country. Um, close to blue lines with wild brook trout, wild uh, rainbows, and some wild browns as well. Uh, I've been uh, doing this for about seven and a half years, and, and as the communications guy out here in the East, my job is to help folks like Dustin uh, tell the stories of the great work the field staff and, um, and to a degree, the uh, volunteers are doing out there on the ground um, to, to work on trout streams. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, this was a, a fun film project. Uh, that we tackled a few years ago and uh, we're looking forward to talking a little bit more about the film and also more uh, to the point about the work that we that we discuss in this film. Awesome well great I'm going to uh, start we'll start by watching together a nation's river and then um, we will uh, go from there. Uh, what I'm sharing right now uh, Trout Unlimited has this great Vimeo channel uh, it's vimeo.com slash Trout Unlimited um, and there's over, as you see, 440 videos. Um, and we're gonna watch A Nation's River, but I encourage all of you to, to tune in and, and check out those, those videos. They're all about different stories uh, across the country. So I'll get started with A Nation's River and I gotta hit the sound. Can you hear the sound or no? Any sound, Dustin? Did it start? Okay, let me uh, reset that sound. Uh, once I share, I can share the sound. Share sound. All right. All right. And you can see my screen though, right? All right. Give me a thumbs up once you can hear the sound. In the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia, small streams tumble through hollows choked with hardwoods and laurel. In the valleys, creeks are born at gurgling limestone springs. These are pretty streams, cold, clear, home to wild trout. Generations ago, there were trophy-sized native brook trout here. Thick, brightly colored char, best measured in pounds, not inches. But as our nation grew, the health of these creeks and these trout was an afterthought. We are improving these streams. Projects are reducing erosion, reconnecting fragmented stream sections, improving fish habitat, making fishing better. This impact reaches beyond these mountains. These are the headwaters of the Potomac, one of the most important rivers in the east, the key artery in a watershed that supplies drinking water for roughly 12 million people. The projects in these mountains are about helping trout, but the work is about so much more. So when you think about it, TU has a really narrow mission, right? It's just it's about trout and salmon. But the fact is that everything we do on the landscape affects water. Probably 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when we were first founded, uh, the organization would focus on the point of impact. And then over time, we moved from that sort of stream by stream approach to a watershed approach, where the idea was, hey, let's stop putting these band-aids on problems, and instead, let's actually solve the problem. And now we've realized that we have to work at scale. This river has gotten so much better directly as a result of the Clean Water Act. The reason it's gotten better is that in the headwaters of the Potomac, up in places like West Virginia, we've cleaned up those small streams. So the, the streams that are supplying the cold, clean water into the Potomac are much healthier than they used to be. If 
folks in West Virginia like to, to deer hunt, and dig ramps, and catch brook trout. Because they are so inspirational, I think folks are more willing to, to jump on board and, and to try to do something to conserve a species we're all so passionate about. You know, the brook trout serve as this, this indicator species for us. And these farmers have long-term relationships with these properties. You know, they intimately manage that land. And so a lot of the farmers themselves have watched the brook trout populations decline. And so we use that as a surrogate for the water quality. What we do is we work with landowners to make conservation an easy choice by essentially providing a one-stop shop to deliver conservation services that vary from anything from building fence to planting trees and installing alternative water systems to actually restoring the in-stream habitat as some of these streams have incised and the cattle tromp some of the banks and we start to see uh, stream bank erosion in a lot of these cases where topsoil is being washed down into the Chesapeake Bay. So our farmers don't like to see that and nor do the folks in the bay because it's their livelihood that's essentially being washed downstream. Growing up, you would come through and you would see eight to ten trout, catch several trout, you know, and over the years the pools have gone away and the banks have eroded and, and uh, I was just trying to find a way to uh, try and preserve it, get it back to the way that it used to be. You know, I don't know if that's necessarily possible, but, but with what we've done here, it's really made a big impact on, on what we have. We try to start at the top of the watershed, so we do select our priority locations that are usually your best of the best. You know, we have the best water quality and the best habitat. Um, as it makes its way downstream, it sees a variety of stressors from timber harvest and agriculture and, and development. Um, so we, we start in these headwater communities. We rally around this state fish, you know, that is a heritage species for our people. When people come from Washington, I tell them that you're drinking our water. And, uh, and we've got headwater systems for a lot of the major rivers around here. And for us, when we're working on things like brook trout, we're also working on things that create, create drinking water for folks downstream. I've got this place that I live, and, and that's where the landscapes around us are the way they should be. Okay? In other words, they're healthy, they're resilient, they're productive. You know, the, the streams, the forests, the, the open lands are, are vibrant and alive. And then you've got communities around these areas that are also healthy, productive, sustainable. There's a quality of place that's in these communities. And, and what we're looking for and what we've worked with Trout Unlimited and, uh, and other partners that we work together on is this codependency between the landscape that's around us and these communities around us as well. Colby and I grew up in Richmond, uh, not too far away, and you know, like a lot of folks who live in the Piedmont, if you want to trout fish, this is this is where you come here to the Shenandoah Valley. So uh, nobody in our family fly fished. We had a little farm pond not too far from our home, and once we had kind of conquered bait fishing it and spin fishing it, um, on our 10th birthday we asked for a fly rod because we wanted a, kind of another challenge. And so we got ourselves into it. We pushed each other through the sport, and as soon as uh, we started figuring that pond out with a fly rod. It was heading to the mountains in Virginia to try and figure out trout. Quality of the fishing here is always has drawn people. The sport's grown, the state has grown, the town has grown, and so the only way to accommodate the growing number of anglers is to open more water to public use and or improve waters to make them more fishable and, and better fisheries. And so certainly that's been happening uh, here in the valley and around the state. A lot of that is thanks to, to Trout Unlimited. Basically, yeah, build it and the fish will come. You, you know, actually, at, when we're putting in structures and you have a pool, you come back even the next day with the equipment and there's fish in the pool. And then you come back and in the summertime, there's surface water and we're showing in. Um, increase of fish use in the habitat we're creating. 
So the water quality of North River up on the National Forest in the mountains is really critically important for the water quality and habitat for Mossy Creek down here in the valley. Mossy Creek, the area we did the restoration work on, had previously been impounded by a dam. Once that dam was breached in the 1940s, the stream downcut through decades of sediment that had deposited, which, can, which created the stream to be entrenched and wide and couldn't access its floodplain. By creating more floodplain connectivity, we allowed the stream to get out of its banks when it floods, spread out and slow down and deposit sediment out in the floodplain so it's not being deposited on the stream bed. Which in turn means we get cleaner gravel, we get the nutrients that can create pollution for downstream waters in the Chesapeake Bay, depositing the floodplain where plants can uptake those nutrients and grow to create a, an intact riparian buffer. So it's really one of the uh, more rewarding parts of the job is to know that folks are able to come out to a site where you've done restoration work and catch fish where previously it would have been almost impossible or, or very difficult to do. We provided more access for anglers, better habitat for more fish, which means the creek can handle more angling pressure. And so to be able to see folks using that and to hear compliments from them about how great it looks, about how it's never fished like this in 20, 30 years, or it's as good as it's ever been, really, really kind of, you know, puts a feather in the cap of, of the project that you know you've done a good job with it. There's not one person in America, be they parents or not, who would like to pass on a dirtier land legacy to their kids, right? And, and it's, it's our ability at TU to sort of grab onto that and then to make a long-term commitment that I think distinguishes us from most other conservation. I came to Trout Unlimited because my personal mission aligns well with Trout Unlimited's mission. And that's to leave my daughter with a better place than what, what I had growing up. And I came from a family of coal miners, you know, that were extracting our resources and, and using it to the fullest extent. And I always just wanted to, to be able to invest in those. You know, we, we watched some of our trout streams decline over the years down in southern West Virginia. So to be able to see one that has declined actually lift back up is the most gratifying feeling I can say. You're muted, Jeff. I said, of course I am. I had to X out of that before the next video played. So awesome. That was that was really fun to watch. Um, uh, folks, uh, thanks for, for watching. Uh, Dustin and, and Mark are here. Uh, happy to take your questions about the work on the Potomac um, headwaters. Uh, and I, I actually, I'll, I'll start. And uh, but you all can you can use the Q&A or the chat. Um, uh, to, to ask your question and we uh, and, and we'll go from there. Um, my first is um, doesn't seem to ever fail that when you're going to shoot a video you've got high water huh those conditions look pretty tough to, to catch trout in huh? I think it looked worse than it was actually but maybe <clears throat> Dustin could speak to that. I, I like to have a little bit of color in the water honestly. Um, as, as you could see from the foliage we shot that in uh, early fall uh, October, right about, uh, you know, a couple weeks from now. Or, and, um, and typically at that time of, of year in, in the mid Atlantic here, streams are really low, um, and, and can be really tough to finish. So I actually think we did get some rain, but I think it worked out for us. Um, we were able to get enough fish for, for the video. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. That's, that's always the challenge that and, and getting a quality shot slash trying to catch fish. Um, as the cameraman likes to be in front of you and anybody who catches brook trout knows that you can't have somebody standing over top of you or in front of you if you actually expect to catch something out there. 
Um, I just want to say a few things looking at that video. Um, I can see how old my daughter was, which was about three years ago. She was about three and now she's six. And, and it goes along with watching our projects grow out there too. So Greg Holver, the landowner that was on there, um, we excluded livestock from around 3,000 feet of stream, did some in-stream work, built some nice pools like we described and, and restored the tree canopy on the sides. The most, the highest amount of fish we ever picked up out of that reach was, was eight. And it has sequentially climbed. And Greg called me Friday night, stoked because we sampled 45 fish out of his reach, included three age classes of fish and a couple that were over 11 inches. Um, so we are literally watching the revival of these streams out there. And it's just, it's incredible re-watching this video and then, and then seeing the end product right now. Or not the end, but what we have three years later. How much uh, livestock uh, ex uh, exclusion have you done uh, in the Potomac headwaters? Uh, within the Potomac itself, um, I would say we are over a million feet of fence um, across West Virginia, Virginia and Maryland. Now we're over 2 million feet. Um, we usually do around seven miles to 10 miles a year. Um, if not a little bit more, um, you know, while we're out there building those fences, though, we also need to put in alternative water sources because if we're going to remove the livestock access, we need to provide good steady uh, troughs, trough systems to put in out there. So there's a lot of work that, that goes along with that fence too. And, and we're planting several, several hundred acres of riparian habitat a year as well. Um, there, there was a, a comment from, from Doug about Tenkara and it was, it was a good eye, Doug, that Seth, Seth um, Kaufman, who, who manages the program in the upper Shenandoah was Tenkara fishing, um, on the North River, which is a little mountain brook stream on national forest land. So uh, good, good eye on that. Um, real quick, and it looks like we got another question popped up here, but while we're still talking about this West Virginia work, Dustin, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of when this program really got going and how long you've been at it? Um, it's not that long actually to consider the, the massive amount of uh, work that's been done already and the, and the milestones you've already hit. Sure. Yeah. So the actual Potomac program, oddly enough, began at the highest point in the Chesapeake Bay um, on, on Big Run that comes off of Spruce Knob working on a grazing allotment that was on National Forest property um, where TU and an array of other partners uh, went out and, and started to build fences um, and then kind of partnered up with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and worked to create this turnkey situation. So uh, it's, the program has been around since 2005. Um, I joined in working in 2012, so I'm approaching my 10th year with the program. Um, now, I think we're pretty steady with the outputs that we have, uh, but 10 years ago, it was kind of one of those situations where we just kept doubling and doubling and doubling the volume of work that's, that's being put on the ground out there. Um, I think this year alone, we'll go over 10 miles of, of high quality in-stream restoration work, um, hundreds of acres of riparian. Um, we're going to pull out three to five undersized culvert crossings. Um, there are multiple excavators that are out there right now trying to finish this work up um, before the fish start to move around for the spawn. And honestly, we'll be stopping probably here in the next week or so and focusing more on putting fences in and, and planting our trees out there. So around 15, 16 years we've been at it. That's great. Um, that answered one of the questions was actually asking about what kind of projects you're currently working on. Um, do you anticipate, so kind of a three-parter, do you anticipate the, the program uh, and project opportunities growing? Where's the funding come for most of these projects? And are there opportunities for TU members to get involved in the Potomac watershed work? Absolutely, yes. Um, funding out there that supports this work comes a lot through private foundations, as well as some of our state and federal agencies like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, U.S. Forest Service. Um, in terms of leveraging TU donor dollars. Um, that's probably one of the most valuable things we can bring to the table. We can take that private funding and amplify it up to four times out there on the ground. Um, you know, it's very helpful um, in equipment purchases or just to keep things functioning um, as a whole, uh, where we can continue to match that in the long term. 
also in terms of engaging folks and getting your hands dirty or getting your hands wet. Um, you know, we're constantly out sampling our projects. So if you're a fish squeezer like me <laughs> and like to see them, um, we have a lot of opportunities to get out and, and sample these sites with our electro fishing crews. Um, lots of opportunities to plant trees out there as well. Um, and then we do, um, when things are more normal uh, and you're able to get closer to folks, um, we do a lot of workshops too for water quality monitoring, um, benthic macroinvertebrates, so your stream bugs, habitat, that sort of thing. Um, How can so people are, connect to that work? Is there like a, a website or a, an email list group for that? You can reach directly out to me. <laughs> and yeah, I will happily... Also in, yeah, and Dustin you. does a really good job of managing his uh, Potomac Headwaters Facebook page too. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities to get posted there. And that and that work um, it includes, uh, you know, it's, again, it's it's some of this is on private private land that's funded primarily through farm bill dollars, um, and um, and then a lot. Some of the work is also on the, the national forest, which the, the Monongahela National Forest over in West Virginia and in Virginia, it's the George Washington Jefferson. So that work is, is, is funded uh, primarily through the Forest Service. Um, so it is, it really is, there's lots of different pots of money and lots of different opportunities. Um, hey, Jeff, real quick, can I address this question from Doug Zayner on the- Please do, yeah, absolutely. Um, just be, because I think this, that's a really good question, Doug. And I think it's important to point out, Virginia, um, I'll let Dustin speak a little bit to West Virginia regs. But uh, the situation up there on uh, Mossy Creek, Beaver Creek, and the North River, they're all sort of part of this, comp we call it the North River Complex, um, is very interesting because you've got the North River, which is a uh, national forest. It's about eight miles of this uh, uh, pretty little uh, native brook trout stream. That's managed under general uh, Virginia fishing regulations. So there's... Um, uh, yeah, I think the limit is, uh, I, I don't know what the limit is because I never keep wild trout. I think it's five or six fish of seven inches or more, but it's primarily going to be a catch and release fishery. Uh, there is a stretch down low that is a put and take fishery with stock fish. Uh, the Mossy, Mossy Creek and Beaver Creek, which are two tributaries to the North River, both of these are down in the valley floor and they're actually spring fed. Uh, so they're unique, they're low gradient. Uh, these are on private land, but both are managed with this unique public-private partnership where the landowners have agreed to allow access. Um, members, or, uh, access is, is uh, managed through a, a free permit that you get through the Department of Wildlife Resources here in Virginia. You just have to sign up for it. Mossy Creek, the public stretch, is fly fishing only. And I think you're allowed to maybe keep one trophy trout, I guess if in case you catch a state record or something, uh, 20 inches plus on Mossy Creek. Uh, Beaver Creek is, is uh, also a public private partnership and you get a daily permit at a little country store there and there are only four of those uh, a day and they're free, but they request a donation. That, and those donations um, then help fund some stocking, which we're trying to kind of cut back on as the wild trout pick up and, um, and also a lot of the habitat work on Beaver Creek. So it's really kind of this unique uh, um, situation there with the regs. West Virginia, I think those streams are primarily managed under regular West Virginia regulations, right, Dustin? Yeah, that's correct. The majority of ours are, are kind of um, put and take or completely wild or native streams that are there with no catch and release regulations on them. There are some kind of intermittent sections within each one of these watersheds where you will see some catch and release. Um, not necessarily always tailored to where your best wild and, and native populations are present though. Um, however, the uh, here in West Virginia, where I'm sitting, I didn't mention that earlier, <laughs> but um, uh, the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources is recently revamping their trout management plan. Um, so we may see some more kind of progressive regulations coming out um, with potentially size limits on, on brook trout streams or slot limits um, out there, as well as they've been looking to increase the catch and release waters available to anglers. Um, the good news is a lot of these watersheds that we're working in, particularly the Potomac watersheds, are limestone spring-fed streams that are high abundance 
um, big fish size, you know, and, and can actually handle some of the angling pressure they receive, at least the ones that, that have the more robust populations. As you travel further eastward, out toward the eastern panhandle of the state, um, our brook trout kind of sizes and abundances uh, deplete some, and it's kind of the edge of their stronghold area. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some opportunities out there for some catch and release. And one particular stream that we partnered with the Division of Natural Resources for a reintroduction on is now a fly fish only in producing 12 plus inch native genome fish um, that's out in the Cacapin drainage. So, and we're looking into as well. And any of the private landowners that are interested in these regulations, we are facilitating those conversations <laughs> as much as we can. Yep. And there's some really good questions I see popping through here, Jeff. So if you want to shepherd us through those. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll come back. Let's come back to the West Virginia for a second. But while we still have folks on, uh, I, there's a question about plans to expand this type of work to other watersheds in v Virginia on the other side of the line. Um, Mark or Dustin, uh, what, what's going on in, in, in that side, this side of the Potomac? Absolutely. Um, so we have um, a, a really emerging Upper James Home River initiative that I don't believe was mentioned in that um, video that, that covers the headwaters of the Jackson, as well as even lower tributaries below Lake Moomaw to some extent. Um, and then that work is also trickling over to the South Branch. Um, I know we have a lot of work going on in the North River, as Seth had mentioned there, um, and a lot of national forest work that's up and coming as well. So we have our eyes on what's going on out there and trying to figure out what the highest priorities are. Um, and we're always kind of open to, to looking into other opportunities down the road, especially where we have those robust brook trout or native wild trout strongholds. I think one thing that, that we, we need to mention with this though, is that um, when we launched these, these programs, which they fall under the umbrella of our Home Rivers Initiative uh, program, uh, we can't do it without funding. So um, typically we have to have funding in place before we're able to really get one of these going. Um, and uh, so, and, and typically we like to have funding that's gonna cover the cost of the program for several years, because as we all know, it, it, it requires long-term commitment. Um, and so that's a challenge, but it's not one that's, um, uh, impossible and we just saw that up in uh, New York and Vermont with the launch of the Bat and Kill Rivers Home Rivers Initiative, which this was largely um, started by the grassroots up there. Uh, some, some leaders who said, we need to get into the Bat and Kill and do some work here, how can we do this? And uh, Keith Curley, the VP of, of the Eastern Conservation Program said, we'd love to work, let's start working on how to raise money. And, and the volunteers raised a bunch of money that then was able um, to help us get this program off the ground. It's in its second year. The guy who's running the program, his name is Jacob Fetterman, doing a phenomenal job. He's, they're already doing a bunch of restoration work on the Bat and Kill and tributaries. So, um, you know, there. If somebody has an idea on a watershed that really needs to have a program like this in place. Um, reach out to us and we'll start talking about fundraising efforts to get it going because the more the better you know if we can if we could do this in more watersheds in virginia we would love to be able to do that yeah and i think it's important to note at least for the the current programs in virginia maryland and west virginia we are not funded by membership dues or donations uh, you know I, as i always say we sing for our supper out there we are funded by the conservation that we deliver on the ground so as, as I was saying earlier, a lot of private foundation dollars that are available as well as some state and federal agency funding. Um, so Dustin, I know you wanna answer this question about the unengineered uh, levies because that's something that I, I recall um, that you, you were involved in on several of these projects. Um, so, and then, and then of course this, this bulldoze by landowners, highway departments after floods, very damaging. That's the, that's a topic near and dear to my heart. I've written extensively about it and studied it pretty extensively. I just wrote another piece about it down in North Carolina, um, you know, regarding North Carolina. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that, that too, but why don't you, why don't you start us off on that, Dustin? Sure. And that is a, 
something we have dealt with the aftermath of particularly, you know, using like the North Fork of the South Branch Potomac um, up near Seneca Rocks, West Virginia, you can go out and, and see some of these stream channels that were just completely reamed out after the floods with big D9 dozers. Um, so I guess addressing what we're left with out there is something that is a high priority for us. So getting back in and installing the rock and logs back in the channel, reconnecting those floodplains. Um, we do have one of our first, you know, um, we call them berms, um, you know, linear disposal area by technical definition, you know, the rocks that they piled up. We have our first project that's under um, a federal agency that we're able to actually take those berms down, reconnect the floodplain, restore the in-stream habitat out there. Um, it is a challenge uh, because I think a lot of landowners perceive them as, as protective measures when the water comes up, but with a little bit of hydrologic information, you can quickly prove that theory wrong. They, they don't do anyone any favors. Um, so we're working on an individual project basis with each landowner to try to deal with those as much as we can. And we are having some, some success out there. So it's kind of one of those, you know, 15 years ago, we had to get the first folks to sign up to, to build some fence. Um, now we're getting the first folks signed up to take the berms down. Um, in terms of the actual post-flood recovery activity as it's coming up, um, we try to work with both our federal and state partners to discourage that type of activity and, and get away from it as much as possible out there. So we are on the ground and we live in these watersheds. So even when those, um, you know, when they're dealing with that, that putting that work out there, um, we'll try to stop by and, and inform the process throughout the whole way. So working from the top of the agency to the folks that are putting the work in on the ground trying to influence it in a way that's not going to destroy our fisheries where we will have to come back and restore them later. One of the, one of the things that we've, we've really seen in the last few years, especially as these, these high water events become more frequent and more devastating is, you know, these storms will roll through and there will be massive damage. There'll be culverts that wash out and bridges that wash out. And, um, the municipalities and the other, uh, uh, folks who, who own these, these, uh, this damaged infrastructure, you know, they, a lot of times they're going to jump on it and they're going to, their priority is we got to reconnect these roads. So um, they, the tendency has been to do quick fixes. And a lot of times those quick fixes are engineered at the same level that the failed infrastructure was engineered under. So it's basically throwing bad money after bad projects. So there's a there's an educational component to this where we're trying to help municipalities and landowners uh, understand the importance of engineering this infrastructure, not for the past, but for the future, which looks, you know, dire in a lot of ways in terms of these these heavy rain events. Um, we've got a, a really good technical assistance program that's been uh, meeting with uh, municipalities up in the Northeast and also in Pennsylvania. We're trying to expand that. Uh, this uh, latest tropical storm Fred in, in uh, North Carolina provided us with another opportunity to um, educate folks about fixing things the right way. Um, along those lines, the other thing that we know is that it's much better to preemptively design this stuff well than to have to go back and fix it. So. Uh, in North Carolina, for example, we had volunteers who uh, dedicated 2,000 hours to survey uh, road stream crossings on public land in the, the National Forest, uh, Nantahala National Forest and Pisgah National Forest. And so they went through and they looked at all these road stream crossings. We identified the ones that are most at risk, and that's informing us and helping us prioritize our work there. Again, that takes a lot of money. The good news is there, there are a growing number of potential funding streams, no pun intended, for this work. Um, one of the most important, which is currently uh, being considered in, in Congress, which is the infrastructure bill. So um, there, there is money to be, uh, to be had on preemptively designing um, this, this infrastructure and, and, and fixing it. So we're, we're continuing to do that. I would also add that for folks watching, um, eyes on the ground is important. If you see something that looks like, if you see a D9 bulldozer in a, in a stream bed after a flooding event, please contact somebody. 
because uh, that, uh, you know, that's really important. We saw um, how important that was after uh, Hurricane Irene up in uh, the Northeast in 2011, where bulldozers just went into these, these streams and just blasted through them. And uh, fortunately, we had members who took photos and documented all this stuff. Uh, un unfortunately, there's been tens of millions of dollars added to the cost of repair from that storm, fixing the damage that was done by the supposed fixes. So eyes on the ground are really important for that. And, and please keep that in mind. Um, Larry, Larry Orrid asked a question. Hey, Larry, thanks for joining us. Uh, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, He's, he, he wants to know a uh, proposed underground fire research mine at Mace on Elk River headwaters. Have you heard about that, Dustin? I'm not familiar with that one. I have, Larry, and, and we should be bringing that up in our, one of our upcoming advocacy conversations. That is a, a scary thing to consider within limestone country and some of our prime brook trout waters. So we should have a discussion about that as soon as possible. Well, great. All right. Well, I, I want to let Mark and Dustin get back to the important work of uh, saving more 14 inch brook trout so that when I get down there again after COVID, uh, I can catch them. Um, if anybody has any more questions, um, pop them in. Uh, otherwise, Doug. yep, go ahead. Nicole, Doug says Nicole's asking about uh, Maryland, the Maryland side of, of all this. Oops, there go my dogs. Absolutely. Uh, was was there a specific question regarding Maryland or just a general overview of the program? I think just, yeah, just maybe talk a little bit about the stuff that Seth is doing, Seth Messenger, another Seth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our Maryland program currently kind of mimics the ones that were highlighted uh, in the video itself. So we are working on a lot of ag exclusion projects where we're, you know, re removing livestock access from the streams. Um, you know, putting in alternative water sources, replanting, revegetating our, our riparian habitats along the streams. Um, Seth also uh, is doing some land protection up there with both private landowners as well as the state for potential state access to some of the properties that they're, they're easing for putting conservation easements on. Um, he is cur currently just finished up a fish passage project where he removed an undersized culvert and replaced it with a span bridge structure. Um, this program has, has just been around for a couple of years now, but it is continuing to grow and we are getting a lot of good support over there, um, both in the local community as well as funding wise. And so um, high expectations for that area. And that's Primarily in the Savage Headwaters, uh, we're looking to expand into the Castleman and are aware that there's some pretty good opportunities in the upper Yakagini as well. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? I, one of the things that I think is just so cool about what, what Seth's got going up there is the connection with Frostburg State. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those students are coming out in droves to help with his projects. Um, so shout out to Frostburg State. Um, and those, yeah. I think it's the Five Rivers kids, but it's also just general um, environmental science uh, students too. So they're really doing a, a great job. Um, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> it was the hottest summer on record over large swaths of Virginia and West Virginia. Deep drought coincide through July and August. Any uh, information on trout populations being extirpated due to these climate change driven events? Um, that, that's a super question and obviously very topical. Uh, Dustin, since you're the biologist, um, why don't you tackle that one? Absolutely. So uh, based on our on the ground monitoring efforts, we have not seen any streams completely wink out. Um, we did see a decline in the numbers that we have now, but it's still a little bit early. Um, our, our private lands sampling efforts, you know, that are far out into to the Eastern Panhandle where I'd be the most concerned are pretty minimal. Um, so there's nothing that's, you know, statistically valid to say that these streams are, are dropping off completely right now. Um, we did see a pretty decent uptick in some of our project streams. The one that I was describing is one of those kind of far eastern panhandle streams where we saw the fish numbers go way up. So uh, as a fish lover, fish biologist, um, I, I'm not that concerned 
as of yet with the data that I'm seeing from our own crews, as well as what our partners are bringing to the table. But ask me this question again in December, once we've had a chance to look at the data across the board, and I'd be happy to come back to it. I, I, I would like to add something to that, which is, um, you know, this is obviously some, a, a huge priority for us to, to keep our eyes on, on how the changing climate is uh, potentially impacting trout streams. And um, you know, we've all heard uh, a lot of the, about a lot of the modeling that is really dire. But uh, for, for long term, you know, looking 30, 40, 50 years into the future, one thing that we've started utilizing here in the East and we continue to expand this, this program is what we call the portfolio concept. And it's, it's basically modeled after uh, financial investment strategies, which is, a diversified portfolio um, creates, uh, it reduces risks. So uh, we use, G it's basically, it's, it can be kind of complicated, but we use GIS mapping and with a bunch of different layers to, to look at watersheds and, um, and various uh, risk factors or beneficial factors within those watersheds. And we overlay those and then we use that to prioritize where we're going to be doing work. And one of those layers is climate um, and, and climate risks. So it could, be, it could be related to elevation. It could be related to riparian cover that provides shade, so forest cover. Um, it can be related to groundwater influences. So when we are considering various places to spend our money, uh, what we do is we, we use this portfolio concept to look at the places where that investment makes the most sense. And that's going to continue to become more and more important for us um, over oh, in the future. We, we've got this in place, like I said, in the East already. We just uh, launched one um, in, in uh, the Great Lakes region. And um, I believe we just got a, a grant from the, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation to uh, implement a, a similar program in New Jersey of all places. So, so this is something that we're looking at. And you know, that the single year thing is, is worrisome. We never like seeing that, but what we really don't like seeing is trend, trends. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna be paying attention to what this year could have done, uh, but we're really paying attention to what's gonna look like, you know, what things are gonna look like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line. But super question, thanks for asking that. Yeah, these are excellent questions. Oh, good. All right. Well, I will, um, I'll let everybody get back to their day. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation. I enjoyed watching that film again. I enjoyed seeing your daughter um, this high and knowing she's this high now. And, you know, my girls the same way. And Mark, yours, yours are off at college now. So um, it's pretty, pretty amazing how fast time, time flies. Um, thanks for doing this. Thanks for joining Trout Week and, 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 participating in this. We'll do more of these. I, I think they're, they're valuable and um, they do. It engages a lot of people and we'll try different times, different days of the week, all that. So um, thanks for everybody who joined us here on, on Zoom. Um, we had a good consistent 15 to 20 people on Facebook too, which was pretty awesome. And um, you can actually watch this or share this uh, by sharing our Facebook page. Uh, and we'll also post that on the Trout Week uh, website, uh, tu.org slash Trout Week. So I uh, hope to see you some some future Trout Week events too. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dustin. And thank you. Thanks to all you. Thanks to everybody. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, okay. thank you all. Please reach out with any questions or follow up. Absolutely. Well, bye -bye. Have a great day, guys. Thanks.